you know, ultimately, quantitative study tends to change what you're studying. And eventually, you end up with something like this. Let me explain what this is. First of all, there's a linguist at Stanford, Chris Manning, who's developed a tagger uh, to which you can feed a corpus, uh, uh, and it returns it to you with each word tagged for parts of uh, speech. And uh, there's a little group of digital humanities uh, people, led by my colleague Matt Jockers, uh, we formatted about 300 British, 19th century British novels in the way that Tagger needs. It needs uh, some special whatever accolades to work. And so we fed them to the Tagger and we got them back, uh, you know, divided into their various categories. And uh, for instance, IN, which is subordinating prepositions and conjunctions, where 11.7% of all words in the novels uh, we have from the 1780s. 12.5 in the following decade, 12.8 in the 1800s, and N nouns where 12.7, uh, 14.1, and 14.1%, uh, and then, you know, the whole category. And then P is proper names, and RB is adverbs, VBD is uh, past tense of verbs, VBZ is third person. There are, uh, I think, 40 or, it depends from, uh, the, it changes linguist to linguist, but you know, all these categories, you can follow their modifications uh, across time. Now, this is not the only new, uh, mercifully, not the only new object of knowledge, but it is a new object of knowledge and it uh, um, sort of uh, deploys uh, uh, shamelessly one aspect of the enterprise, which is that however redefined, the object of knowledge has nothing to do with texts. Texts remain the real objects of literary history, obviously, and they are what we read. Yesterday on the plane I was reading Hedda Gabler. I wasn't reading these things. But real objects are not the same as objects of knowledge, just as reading is not the same as knowing. You want to read? Ibsen. You want to know? Something like this. What can one do with this? Let me give you an example which will bring me to the word empirical, which I haven't uh, used yet. I'm writing a book, a different book, on the figure of the bourgeois uh, in which there is a Victorian chapter in which I discuss the Victorian nude and claim that uh, uh, the conventions of the Victorian nude were such that instead of revealing the body and by extension material reality, this form tended to uh, veil it, to cover it up. I may be right or wrong on this, but you know, this is my idea about that. And then I started thinking, uh, well, this is visual representation. Is there something in verbal representation that can do the same thing, that, uh, that can act as a veil? And I think of adjectives. And I think, yeah, that, that must be one of the keys to Victorian rhetoric. Little Dorrit, our mutual friend, bleak house, great expectation, even in titles. I mean, it seems that. So I immediately sort of uh, went to the tagger with, uh, uh, with this idea, and it's ideal for these kind of questions. Um, I sort of charted the results, waited for this magnificent rise of the adjective to emerge in mid century, and this is what I got a perfectly flat line at 6% throughout uh, the century. Such an idea. This is one thing quantitative data are excellent at, falsifying hypotheses. Experiments are a dialogue between fact and fancy, Peter Medawar uh, once wrote. We're all very good at fancy in literary studies, quantitative data, good at facts. Empirical, indeed. Now, word frequency, adjectives, parts of speech, ad, um, abstractions, style, language. Uh, something, a layer of the text that's become very easy to study in a quantitative fashion uh, nowadays. Plot is much more difficult. And that's a problem because if you work, as I do, on novels and uh, plays, if you cannot quantify plot, which is the key of the whole thing, uh, the enterprise remains uh, uh, shaky. How can you quantify plot or give it you know, an empirical foundation of sorts? This is where network theory comes in. This is a theory that studies connections within large systems of objects. The objects can be just about anything. Banks, neurons, film actors, scientific papers, friends, uh, and they're usually called vertices. Uh, the connections between them are usually called edges. 
and the analysis uh, of uh, vertices and edges has revealed some uh, unexpected properties of large systems. The most famous of them is so-called small world effect or six degrees of separation, i.e. the rapidity with which you can reach any vertex in the network beginning from any other vertex. The theory proper requires a level of mathematical sophistication that I unfortunately completely lack, and it typically uses enormous quantities of data, which will also be missing from this paper. But I do it here just the same, because even in this very pre-modern uh, form that I have put together, I think it has interesting things to say about plot. And then this paper that you're hearing will be followed by a second one, uh, co-authored with two research scientists at uh, the IBM Visual Labs uh, and Matt Jokers at Stanford. And the second paper will have um, digital data gathering, math, uh, professional visualization, all of these things. So today, not. So a network, vert vertices and edges. A plot is made of characters and their interactions. Characters will be the vertices of the network. Interactions will be the edges, and here is what the network from Hamlet looks like. There are questionable decisions here in order to make this network, which we can discuss later, but basically in this figure, two characters are linked if some words have passed between them. This is not the only way to do things. There's a previous paper which applied network theory to uh, a group of Shakespeare plays, and there two characters were linked if they had speaking parts and were on stage at the same time. So for instance, for them, um, Osgrave and Gertrude would be linked because they both have speaking parts and they're both on scene at the same time. For me, they're not because they never uh, speak to each other. As you can imagine, you know, uh, um, my choice emphasizes explicit connections, theirs emphasizes implicit connections. They're both plausible at a certain level. Um, their network is denser than mine because they have all my connections by definition plus some. Both models have two major flaws. The first is that the edges are not weighted. Uh, what this means is this, that when Claudius tells Horatio in the graveyard scene, um, I pray the good Horatio wait upon him, this eight words count here exactly as much as the several thousand words that are exchanged between Hamlet and Horatio. And this clearly cannot be right. Second, the edges have no direction. When uh, Horatio addresses the ghost in the opening scene, uh, his words place an edge between the two of them. But the fact that the ghost doesn't reply to Horatio and would only speak to Hamlet obviously is important for the play, and there must be a way to visualize that. Uh, the reason why I haven't done it is because I haven't been able to find a non-clumsy way of doing these uh, two things. And this is one of the many issues that I will invoke the follow-up study whenever I paint myself into a corner and say, well, but in the follow-up study, <laughs> things will be as Anyway, um, four hours that become this, right? Time that turns into space, a character system arising out of many character spaces to use Alex Wallach's concepts in the one versus the many. Hamlet's space, in red, all the direct links to the characters he has a direct interaction with. Hamlet and Claudius, in red or blue, the names of characters speak to the other, to one or not, but not the other. Ophelia and Gertrude, 